So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doug McElrath, Director of Special Collections and University Archives in Horn Bank Library, which is the home of the Gordon W. Prang Collection. Um, as, as Professor Rosenblatt said, this um, is a um, um, this talk tonight, today is part of a uh, long collaboration between the history department and the libraries uh, that's been very important for bringing scholars to use the Prang Collection, which is, is a premier research collection of, of international importance. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker today, uh, Timothy Smith, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His research interests include Japanese religions, new religious movements, religion and modernity, and modern Japanese history. And um, Tim is going to give us a, a kind of preview of, of some of his research and, and conclusions uh, with the fascinating title uh, that you see up here on the screen. So uh, please join me in welcoming Tim Smith. I may actually go a little out of order from the slides I've made because I realized from just walking over here that I probably need to do a fair amount more explaining of what Tenrikyo even is. Um, and that's fair, even this summer I was at a research conference in Japan presenting on a panel on Japanese religion and some of my fellow panelists were stopping me to be like, what, what even is Tenrikyo? So, before that, though, just as a bit of sort of self-introduction where I started on this, pro on this project, um, I actually did my master's at Sophia University in Tokyo, and it's one of those sort of weird happenstance things in that my advisor was a friend of someone who worked at Tenri University, and when I said, expressed interest in studying one of the new religions of Japan, he sort of just right away pushed me over towards here, I have a friend working there, like, let's put you together. Um, it's always these happenstance connections that sort of make some of the most interesting projects, and now I'm still working on it 10 years later. Um, I actually, before I get into talking about Tenryuko, first was inspired by someone in Japanese studies named Jason Josephson Storm, who wrote this book, The Invention of Religion in Japan, that sort of looks at how the category of religion gets negotiated within Japan, combining aspects of sort of Meiji modernization program, um, this point where Japan's first opening up to the Western world and trying to adapt and figure out how it can fit certain aspects of Japanese culture with aspects of Western modernization and modernity. Um, and I wanted to talk to people in Tenrikyo about what does it mean? So again, we'll talk a bit more about that in a second, but Tenrikyo is classified as a new religious movement. One of these groups that somehow doesn't quite manage to fit the bill of what gets counted as a traditional religion. Um, in the case of Tenrikyo, a lot of this comes down to how it did not necessarily agree with some of the general principles of the Meiji modernization project, that there was still aspects of faith healing, a general distrust of westernization going on that sort of put it on the outskirts, on sort of the periphery. But when I went to Japan to do field work. I spent 10 months in Tokyo interviewing members of Tenry. In her original teaching, she claimed that by the end of her life, this would happen. It didn't. Spoiler alert, I'm sure you all already are aware that there's still inequity in the world, unfortunately. This has been reinterpreted as something that's more of a long-term sort of metaphorical goal. Um, and two of the main sort of practices within Tenrikyo, you know, Kishin, daily service, this is one of the things I'm actually looking at, um, a lot of records of sort of its development here at the Prang Collection. Um, nowadays, Tenrikyo thinks of this as sort of just daily volunteerism, this idea that you should be trying to help people in your daily lives. Um, one of the few things, as I was mentioning earlier, even in Japan, people don't necessarily always think of Tenrikyo and remember Tenrikyo as a major movement. One of the few things that people do remember about it is what I have pictured over here, all these people with blue helmets. These are called the Hinokushin Corps. They are literally a group of volunteers who are professionally trained to do like post-earthquake um, 
public rescue and recovery efforts. Um, they'll also help with rebuilding houses, with clearing out rubble. Um, they travel mostly around Japan recovering, uh, doing recovery efforts after some of these, I don't know, mid-range earthquakes is maybe a weird way to put it. Something where it's not necessarily big enough to get sort of this global attention we see after major earthquakes, but large enough to have done damage and still require aid. And the last one is this idea of the Osazuke, the daily service. There's this idea that essentially from the Osazuke, one can essentially do a form of faith healing. But what's interesting about it is, and this is again something that's reimagined over time, it seems like in early Tenrikyo, this is literally a laying on of hands and a healing is performed. Over time, this gets reimagined as a form of pedagogy. It's literally the idea that the reason you are sick is you have somehow gone out of balance in your life. That Often nowadays, these healings will actually be accompanied by long talks about what's going on in your life, and their problems at home, things that, as we'll see, are sort of changing the form of this sort of healing ritual today. This is the central shrine of Tenrikyo, called Jiba, um, for a bit of, and I don't mean to sort of Put this in a strange light or anything. This is literally used to be essentially the town that Nakayama Miki grew up in. Um, it is now Tenri City, that is how big the movement has become. They managed to, I don't want to make it sound like they took over. Yes, sorry. Was that built after her death? Yes. Um, it was first, and we'll see some earlier pictures of it later. They first started building it um, towards the tail end of her life, but it was not finished nor anywhere near this size and scale until much after. In fact, it only achieved this size in like the 80s. And actually, they're still building outward. Um, it's become a bit of a joke that actually every major church lineage in Tenrikyo has a responsibility to pay for part of this sort of grand sort of square they're building around it of different halls that are being used for different things. Tenri University. Um, Tenri also has a pretty impressive museum of Japanese artifacts. These are contained in some of these hallways. The joke is that it's never going to be finished because many of these church lineages fully admit, well, we don't have the money or the manpower to help with this. Why did you assign one of these halls to us? This is a more recent picture of it from when I was there during field work, and I just always want to show off when I pull off a panorama picture that actually looks good. I'm just, that's just bragging, sorry. It's important to note part of why when I look at sort of Tenrikyo, even though my title is contemporary Tenrikyo, I'm, I did 10 months of field work, I'm doing much of this as an ethnographic project, but I mean part of this is also because my background is history. I always want to connect it to historical context. Tenrikyo actually, in order to sort of try and get away from some of the negative reputation of new religions, manages to, in 1908, register as a form of sectarian Shinto. Sectarian Shinto is this strange category which are essentially a bunch of different traditions. Some are what we would call new religions. Some are just different interpretations of Shinto that didn't quite fit in with mainline Shinto. After 1908, for the most part, this does actually get them a fair amount of sort of breathing room, of leeway. They're allowed to do their own thing. But with the rise of Japanese imperialism, these groups end up being essentially suppressed and eventually for many of them co-opted by the state. That Tenrikyo is forced to reject a lot of its early teachings. They actually convert the Tenrikyo seminary into a Shinto chaplaincy program to train Shinto uh, priests to be sent to the front lines for converting colonial holdings. Um, that's part of why this is actually stuff that I found while I was at the Diet Library in Japan that they had some copies of this English newsletter. Um, and this is from 1940 where they're actually in English proudly describing gathering uh, Korean Tenri converts to celebrate the founding of the Japanese Empire. There's some other pretty classic, like, especially of that era racist moments of talking about this is 
finally enlightening like these Korean peasants and teaching them to be like sort of good Japanese subjects. And the thing that I mean, I don't even feel comfortable putting up, but I think it's worth talking about is yes, that even into this rise of militancy, the fact that they had a whole issue talking about welcoming the Hitler youth to Tenry to sort of show off these aspects of what was then being presented as sort of Japanese culture now that it is, again, at this point by the 40s, wholly sort of subsumed into uh, militaristic Shinto, which leads to my project, what I'm actually looking at, that in 1945, obviously the war ends, um, it's actually right away in December of 1945 that American occupation forces change the religious uh, organization's law of Japan, which was part of what allowed sort of this Shintoization of other religious movements. And by 1947, the new Japanese constitution, the post-war constitution, is promulgated guaranteeing a freedom of religion. We see after this, through the 50s especially, a wave of new religious movements, or sometimes actually old religious movements, that just finally had the chance to be recognized and registered as independent. Yet, and this is getting, well, all right, I'll stick with this slide for now. Yet, Tenrikyo actually does not leave sectarian Shinto at this point. And so part of what I wanted to look into here is more about the life of Nakayama Shosen. This is, he's named the Shimbashiro, this means central pillar. He's essentially the administrative leader to Tenrikyo because he is the great grandson of the founders of Nakayama Miki. But he's also a scholar of religion. He studied at Tokyo Imperial University, what is now Todai Tokyo University, under Anesaki, the sort of considered the father of religious studies in Japan. I also always have to make the side note here. His thesis was literally on how Tenri missionary work works. And as the leader of the religion, he could get access to all of it. It seems unfair. Like, I don't have that kind of access to information. <laughs> like, it's a lot harder for me to do this project. And again, his tenure is split between he becomes this leader in 1925. So he is leader of Tenrikyo through this co-option by Shinto, and in this post-war time that he defines as a time of restoration. And he notes, he starts using this term of restoration right away, even as early as the, 19th, of the late 1940s. But it's interesting because the way he defines restoration, this is still how it's used in Tenor today, becomes this theological goal rather than necessarily an actual return to some original form. Restoration does not necessarily mean the resumption of old ways, neither returning things to their former appearances nor sentimentally reminiscing over the past amounts to restoration. It is my conviction that the enthusiasm about and significance of restoration come from the effort to pursue the origin and inquire into the source. No matter how we may pursue and inquire into the origin is a task that we may never complete. For I believe that the more we search, the more we feel ourselves filled with new enthusiasm to search further. I would like to suggest that the restoration is the mother of new worlds and new cultures. That's not normally what we think of when we use the word restoration. It's not necessarily talking about the creation of or return to some original. It's now talking about this idea of creating some kind of new idea. And this ends up being sort of the crux of my ethnographic work, that while my interlocutors didn't want to talk about how we define religion, they found that question boring. What I saw doing field work and doing participant observation alongside them is ways that they were continuing to redefine some of the teachings within Tenryo. I mentioned earlier, and some of you may have already sort of guessed at this, that when this sort of faith healing of Sazuke has become so invested in this idea of talking through one's problems, of figuring out what might be the cause for someone's suffering, it is being rapidly redefined to address mental health issues. That I'm, I've met people who out and out said that they purposely went to take 
courses in becoming counselors and therapists to be better ministers within Tenrico. There's also a lot of work being done to network with other religions and with secular social welfare movements, which may not sound that revolutionary on the surface, but those are usually things done at an administrative level, something where the whole religion is doing some kind of networking. I was meeting individual church members and individual church communities that were saying, well, yeah, no, we didn't bother like talking to the headquarters. We just went ahead and like made this connection with this group. Um, one to sort of show this picture on the side is there's currently a sort of growing, I think this is growing kind of famous, at least within Japan, a movement for children's cafeterias that in Tokyo, because there's actually a growing issue of child poverty and child hunger, that all these different organizations have been setting up their own, again, just sort of monthly or sometimes if they can really afford it, weekly centers where people can come and get cheap or free meals for their children. Um, I've encountered multiple churches that are now operating their own, which, and this is from a past talk I gave, I think it's very interesting that as a new religion, often they get a lot more questions from the parents. So is this, are you really trying to feed our kids or are you just trying to convert them? Um, that's, that's a question for another time. As far as I can tell from my own research, that's not what was going on. There was a genuine desire to help. I even visited one church that still was preserving a sort of pre, sort of this regularization or routinization of Tenry theology site that still has a well that was given a blessing by that second leader, the Honseki, where he claimed this is a sacred well. Anyone who drinks from it, it's like as, as if you'd received this faith healing, this Osazuke. They're still using this well, even though it's nothing that's taught about sort of in core Tenry teachings. I asked some people at headquarters, and they were like, I mean, if, if they say they're still Tenrico, I guess they're still Tenrico, but that doesn't sound like us. Like, I'm not sure what you were seeing up in Tokyo. But they're now adapting this older sort of almost like pre-modernization of Tenrico form of blessing into a very modern form. They're actually addressing collapsing rural church communities by sending blessings to members who may not actually have an active priest still or minister still in their church. Something that keeps people connected to their beliefs, even if they don't have a church network themselves. And I met many, many people who were self-described as hobbyist religionists, hobbyist religious scholars who were also looking at this idea of restoration as something that would allow them to continue innovating. Which kind of leads me to what I'm doing here is I'm trying to, for my overall dissertation, ask how do religions remain relevant in a changing world? How do they address issues like generational change? Much of what I'm observing is due to a rising sort of wave of new young leaders who are coming in, taking over their family's churches. And as a side note, in Tenrico churches, you inherit sort of the roles. It's also, unfortunately, for a religion founded by a woman, pretty patriarchal. It is generally that you have male sons inheriting their father's churches or even their father's sort of administrative roles in the central bureaucracy of the religion. How are they balancing innovation with tradition? How are they trying to sort of negotiate dynamics between the center, the administration, and these churches who aren't necessarily even that far out? These are churches just one city over sometimes who are doing very different things. And of course, because it is this point in Japanese history where a new emperor has ascended to the throne, it is now Reimo I, for anyone who is unaware. We've entered a new uh, imperial age, or maybe I should call it imperial, that sounds a bit bad, but a new dynastic age in Japan. And to a lot of people, this is a burning question, not just for Tenryuku, but for Japanese society in general. What is sort of what's left over after the Heisei era? What is left over after this era that I always have to bring this up even when I'm not teaching about Tenryuko, what a class I taught in Japanese in modern history, I just had to throw this up of literally even the Japan Times is like, well, how do we define the Heisei era? Death, disaster, and insecurity. 
that's pretty heavy. <laughs> and to sort of go into Rewa with this sense of, well, we had 30 years of bad times. Can we do any better, hopefully? But this gets to, again, what I'm actually looking for here is, one of my big questions is, how did this restoration sort of happen? Tenrikyo itself, in most of its histories, doesn't talk a lot about what happens between 1945 and 1970. The actual date, as I mentioned earlier, where Tenrikyo leaves Sectarian Shinto. And in speaking with members of Tenrikyo about this, a lot of them are just like, are you sure about that? That can't, that can't be right. We've been talking about restoration since the 40s. Like, no. But this is true. It's something that I'm still trying to sort of find this sort of gap in why is there sort of this long delay, long pause before leaving sectarian Shinto. And I think it's important to tie this in because I do believe that this whole idea of restoration, of redefining it as something that means innovating to change a religion to match sort of the needs of the time, are exactly what these young new leaders are doing. That they are, in a lot of ways, taking up sort of the same goal, that or the same sort of invitation put forward by Mount Yamashosa in designing this idea of restoration does not mean a return to the old, but a development of something new. And I mean, already, the fact that I've not been to go through all this, I've been, as you can probably imagine, as some of you have probably done at other collections too, I have just been trying to gather as much data as possible to read through later. My Japanese reading is a little slower than it should be, so. But already I found censored materials of Nagayama Shosen's from 1947. That just showed up in my cart this morning, and it took everything to like be like, no, I have to focus on preparing, going to talk to you all, not look at these censored materials. Um, histories of some of the prominent church lineages that, again, I don't know if these were published before or if this is the first chance they're allowed to sort of even name sort of their own history, describe how these different sort of church networks across the country are formed. For a bit about that, because I realize that would be its own sort of weird idea. In Tenrikyo, generally how it works is that there are different separate church networks that under the main headquarters in Tenri City and Nora, there are grand churches, and grand churches is any church that can support 50 churches beneath them. Those 50 branch churches are then allowed to support any number of branch churches or even smaller units called mission stations that they wish beneath them. And there's often not a lot of interaction between these networks, that generally within one grand church network, you may interact with the other branch churches within it, you may interact with the other mission stations or fellowships within it, but there's often not a lot of connection between these different church networks until today. Again, some of the people I were speaking with were talking about why, why aren't we working more together? Why don't we try and build new connections between us? I found proselytization materials, literally like pamphlets of why you should join Tenrikyo from the immediate post-war. The earliest one was published in 1946 in Japanese and in English, which is already kind of blowing my mind of just, I'm sort of wondering where did they get the funding and who were they aiming at? Were they hoping to convert American GIs? I'm not really sure. There's also, I found early issues of the Iraqi Torio. This is the official magazine of the Young Men's Association. Um, the Young Men's Association is essentially a training ground for future church leadership. But often these sons who are going to be heirs of churches are put into the Young Men's Association headquarters. They work in Tenry City in almost a sort of mirror of the kind of like church hierarchy and administration that exists within the central organization. It's almost a chance for them to learn how to take these kind of administrative roles. I should also note, because this still gets me, when we said Young Men's Association, the ages they ascribe to that are, uh, if I remember it, the, the lower end is either 16 or 18, but the higher end is 41. Um, Many of the people I met were still being defined as young men were in their mid-30s and already running their family churches and had sort of these strange 
sort of sort of position within a limbo that they were considered both kind of too young to be taken seriously, but also given the massive power of running their own communities. And finally, because I just couldn't help myself, there were three really amazing children's books produced by Tenry Kyo that's already showing some interesting mixing of sort of popular folk culture and some of these new ideas coming out of Tenry's modernization, and I had to include some pictures that in this one story, there's all these different adventures of this young boy na named Kimpei, who early on meets a Japanese oni, like a Japanese demon, um, isn't scared of him, reminds him that if he's scared and he's looking for his lost parents, and he says he needs to find a drum sort of to summon the rain, he's just like, well, you know where you can find a drum? Any Tenry church will have a nice drum waiting for you takes the demon to a Tenry church, plays the drum, and it allows this demon to get back to the skies, which he later, I'm going to be a little mean about this, takes advantage of. The, there's a group of farmers praying for rain. They say none of their prayers are working, so he bangs on a drum to call for his friend, the rain demon, to call a rain down for them. And when they thank him for doing such a good rain dance, he goes, no, 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 the only person who answers any prayers is the god of Tenrikyo. Let me show you the god of Tenrikyo. And earlier in the story, he also receives a magic box. I'm sorry for leaving that detail out. Using, the, using a magic box summons an airplane to fly them straight to Tenry City. In a scene that seems to be echoing one of these famous early promotional materials, that he is flying them in a plane right over it. It's almost the exact same view as this early shot of when the first central structure of Jiba, of this central headquarters, is pictured via biplane, as far as I can tell. I can't get an accurate date to this. The earliest I've seen it published was in the 40s, so I'm guessing late 30s, early 40s for this picture. Anyway, I do want to thank the University of Maryland. I want to thank the Nathan Jeanette Miller Center for Civil Studies, the History Department, the University of Maryland Library System, and the Praying Collection, and everyone for coming out today and listening to me blather on about my <laughs> research interests. Like I said, I've been now researching this for over 10 years, so it's still super interesting to me, but I realize that some of it might be a little weird to anyone who hasn't gotten this obsessed with this stuff. <laughs> um, but thank you all for coming out, and I do appreciate any thoughts, comments, questions, feedback now, later. I also have 